Good evening, everybody. So glad to be able to join you this way using WebStream to uh, share Good Friday with you. And what better way to do it than is to open with the Word of God. This is recognized as the tail end of Holy Week, the day where Jesus was crucified. And as we look at the Gospel of John, we want to just prepare our hearts for a time of communion that we're going to share. If you don't have it yet, please go get some bread and, and, and any kind of juice if you have and we're, we're going to just be able to share that together. The Gospel of John, the 19th chapter, verses 1 through 6. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They clothed him in purple robe and went up again and again, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they slapped him in the face. Once more Pilate came out and said to the Jews gathered there, Look, I'm bringing him out to let you know that I find no basis for a charge against him. When Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, Pilate said to them, Here is the man. And as soon as the chief priests and their officials saw him, they shouted, Crucify! Crucify! If we would jump down to the 16th verse in that 16th, 19th chapter of the Gospel of John, it says, Finally, Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus, carrying his own cross. He went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic means Golgotha. There they crucify him, and with him two others, one on either side of Jesus, and Jesus in the middle. Pilate had notice prepared, fastened to the cross, and it read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this sign in place where Jesus was crucified near the city, and the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. And the chief priests of the Jews protested, Pilate, do not write the King of the Jews, but this man claimed to be the King of the Jews. And Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. And when the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, dividing them into four shares, one in each of them, with the undergarments remaining. This garment was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. Let's not tear it, they said to one another. Let's decide by lot who will get it. And verses 40 through 42 read, Taking Jesus' body, this is after his crucifixion. I'm sorry. Let, let's read verse 31. Now on the day of preparation and the next day was to be special Sabbath because Jewish leaders did not want the bodies left on the crosses during the Sabbath. They asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. The soldiers therefore came and broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified, Jesus, then, and then the other. But when they came to Jesus... They found that he was already dead. They did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. And jumping down to verse 40, it says, Taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it, put it in spices and strips of linen. This was in accordance with the Jewish burial customs. And at the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. Jesus was buried in a borrowed tomb. And as we look at this account of the death of our Lord Jesus Christ, we can't even fathom the pain he undergone when he took the flogging. He took so many lashes on his back, upon his body, leather strips upon a, a stick more or less, and at the end of the leather strips, there were sharp stones and metals at it. So every time they hit his back, they took chunks of flesh right out of him. Hard enough, most people didn't even endure that. They didn't live through that. But as he endured it, then he would have to ultimately be laid down on that beam and to be nailed in his hands and in his feet and to be erected and there to hang for every breath he would have to take. He would have to lift himself up, pull himself up, Breathe and let himself back down. And this he did because our sins that were so great and so profound, he was the only sacrificial lamb, the perfect sacrificial lamb that could provide a way of escape. And you know, every year the Jews would bring sacrifices to the temple and they would, they would offer sacrifice, but it was only a band-aid until next year and again and again. And this is why Jesus had to come. He was sinless. He was the Son of God. He was born of the Virgin Mary. He came from heaven to earth. He lived his life to about 30 years of age when he began his ministry. And for the next three plus years, he offered his, his full attention to the will of the Father. And this is the culmination of it right here and right now. 
Now, I don't know about you, but I'm awfully thankful. I'm excited what God did for us because on that first Easter, I think it was something like what we're facing. You know, they were sitting behind closed doors wondering what the future was going to hold for them. The, the Jesus that they were banking on and believing would bring political, you know, stature and maybe a seat at the table. He's gone now. What's going to happen to us now? Are they going to chase us down like dogs? A lot like what we're facing today. What does tomorrow hold? What's going to happen next week, next month? But I look at it this way, that what Jesus did, he surprised them as he's going to surprise us. Because he rose on that third day. They had no idea. He tried to give them a word that's what was going to happen. But they didn't get it. But that's why I'm living. And we need to live every day with that hope found in Jesus Christ. That God can provide a way to escape. Even though we don't know what tomorrow holds. We do know who holds us in his hands. And as we look at just these portions quickly. I, I want us to look at two quick things. That first of all, death had no longer a grip. It no longer had a grip. I know diseases and infirmities in our bodies. These are the big things that we say. These are our, 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 our heavy burdens that we carry. But you know what? Death is the greatest fear most people have. And Jesus conquered that. On that third day when he rose from the dead, he was laid in that borrowed tomb. And on third days, we're going to come back on Sunday and celebrate this. He conquered what we call death, that the fear of death, the unknown. But he says, no, it's no longer unknown. It's known because I have provided a way of escape for you. And as he conquered that, death tried to shut down everything Christ had accomplished. He had healed the lame. He had made the blind see. He had made the deaf hear. Women with blood disorders. He had raised the dead on and on and on. And all of a sudden, he's found in a tomb and everyone's panicking. What now? What next? And Jesus was showing us that no longer does death have a grip on our lives. He came to life so that we could have life. And scripture says not just the same amount, but have it more abundantly. Today, you and I can have that same life, that abundant life, that even though the unknown is all around us, our God is with us. And if God be for us, who can be against us? The second thing I want to share with you, and it, it just it's a culmination of, of what we just read and in the Acts of the Apostles, the second chapter, Acts chapter 2, when Jesus had already ascended into heaven and instructions were given, the disciples begin to minister and, and they're now apostles because they are set out. They're set out in the name of Jesus. And we read in the second chapter of Acts, verse 21 through 24, 21 through 24, as Peter gets up, remember this is the Peter that was afraid and he denied Christ three times. Look what the power of the Holy Spirit will do in one's life when you have experience with God and you receive the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. Look what he says here as he stands up to a crowd with boldness and he says this, and everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man credited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him. As you yourselves know, this man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. It was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. We started out with that one verse, and everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. This invitation is to all, and this is my second point is that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You might be a long-time follower of Jesus Christ. You might just be have started to look and say, I, I realize there's more. Or maybe this is the first time you're listening to a message and hearing the Word of God, and you're saying, I need what you're talking about, Pastor. Well, this invitation is for you. Scripture says that whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Today, God wants you to no longer have to live in fear. You may not know what's going on out there, but you can know who's got everything in his hand and who can bring us through day by day, hour by hour, minute by minute. And we need to know that we no longer have to live in fear, the fear of circumstances, the fear of tomorrow, the fear of death. If you call upon the name of the Lord and you say this, Jesus, come into my heart, come into my life. 
I recognize and I acknowledge that you are the son of the living God. I recognize you came from heaven as the word of God says. You came from heaven to earth, born of the Virgin Mary. And you live this life culminating at this point where you laid down your life as a sacrificial lamb for us. Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Let your blood wash me clean. I invite you into my heart and my life, and I ask you to become Lord of my life. If you've done that today, and I, there are no CCD classes, no, no Christian... Uh, you know, no Christian formation classes that you can come to right now because these are unusual times. But the scripture says if you have invited them into your heart and your life, I want to invite you to participate in communion as well today. Because scripture says when even one acknowledges Jesus as Lord, all of heaven begins to rejoice. So if you're going to participate in communion, get your bread, get your cup ready. We had this nice bread. Mrs. C did a phenomenal job making some bread for this. The bread represents the body of Christ. For in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, uh, chapter 11, verses 23 down, says, For I received from the Lord, we also passed on to you. On the night Jesus Christ was betrayed, he took the bread, gave thanks. The night he was betrayed, he took the bread and gave thanks. He broke it and says, This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after supper, he took the cup. It was filled with fruit of the vine. And he says, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. For whenever you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you are proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes. So you and I, by doing this, we're saying, Jesus, you are the Lord of my life. Thank you for coming and you died for me. I'm a sinner, but you've made me clean by your blood. So let's pray right now for the elements as we're about to participate. Father, I thank you for all those in the reach of my voice right now. I pray blessings over their lives. I pray fear will be conquered. It will be tamed. And everyone of the reach of my voice will recognize that death has no power over us. For to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord, it's a win-win situation. The Lord, now as we partake of the bread, we remember that it was your body that was beaten, bruised, battered, and nailed to a cross for my sins. And because what you did... I have hope of eternal life starting now. I don't have to guess about it. I can know with assurance that God provided a way of escape. So we thank you for the bread and for the cup that represents the blood of Jesus Christ. Nothing else can wash away my sins except the blood of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for that. In Jesus' name we pray. And we together said, Amen. Amen. The bread represents the body of Christ. Broken. For you and I, grab your wafer, cracker, whatever you have, bread, and just acknowledge with me, this is Christ's body, which was laid down for my sins. Thank you, God. I will never forget what you have done for me. Even though circumstances don't allow us to gather in a church facility where so many have rituals and traditions of all kinds, we all do. But no one can take away the hope that I have in Jesus Christ because of his death. I can live. Let's partake of the bread together. Your cup, whatever you have, you might even have it in a Dixie cup. It's okay. It's about the blood of Jesus and what he did for you and I. I wish it wasn't a chalice. I wish, yeah, you know, the, the nice fancy setups, and it's all good. But you know what matters is what Jesus did for you and I. And it's the blood of Jesus that washed my sin away. I was lost, but now I'm found. I was spiritually blind, but now I see because of what Christ has done. He said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. For whenever you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's proclaim what he has done for us. He laid down his life so that we can live. Let's take of the cup together. Thank you, God. Thank you, God, for life. Thank you, God, for salvation. Thank you, God, for forgiveness of sins. Thank you, Lord. I rejoice for all those who have said the sinner's prayer, even tonight, that we will always remember. Some will remember the bad of, of COVID-19, but I'm going to remember all of you who text me or message me or say amen after you watch this video. And you're going to say, Pastor, I accepted Christ into my heart. You said amen. And I'm going to remember that was the season, the first day you invited Christ into your heart and life and began this new journey. Not a life of total fearless, but saying, no, fear is being controlled now because the God that I serve is alive and well. Jesus conquered death. 
I'll be okay with the help of the Lord. Hey, thanks for being with us here today. Can I also remember, people have asked, how can, you, how can we give? How can we still support the work of ministry, the church? Because we know there's no other source of, of income except the donation of, of people like yourself. Please, would you go on our website, GarfieldPraise.com, or on our PayPal, give it by PayPal, or through Venmo. You can give your donation. It will mean the world to us, and we'll be forever grateful for your sacrifice. We know times are tough, and that's why we know that people's giving is sacrificial. Or you can mail it in, uh, send it into Praise Church, PO Box 206, Garfield, New Jersey, 07026. But please, on behalf of Praise Church and the ministry that we've been offering for the last, oh, a lot of years, over 50 years or 55 years now, Thank you that we can keep bringing the message of hope. Thank you for your giving. God bless you. Please tune in on Sunday at our Easter Resurrection Sunday morning celebration. It's going to be fantastic. God bless you. Welcome. We're so glad you could join with us. Let's worship together. We are thankful for the sacrifice that Jesus made for us and the blood that was shed. That's the only thing that can cleanse us from all of our sins. Father, we thank you that you are present with us. Lord, with every person that's watching, you are there in their homes. Lord, we have never been left. We've never been abandoned. Thank you, Lord, that we can come together in this solemn time of remembrance for the great sacrifice and gift of love that you gave us. Thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Ah 
I could not find In desperation I turned to heaven And spoke your name Into the night Then through the darkness Your loving kindness Tore through the shadow
Friday. How can one describe such a day? The wrongdoing of all humanity putting to an end an innocent man, the Son of God. This is the story of Jesus' death by way of a cross, all in one moment bringing death to the bright light of our future. He never stopped loving us, and yet this is the incredible part of it. Our sin stopped his heart. Our sin drove the nails firmly in the hands of God. All along, these were the plans. We told ourselves that we were in control, and this was deemed sufficient for all of us. The brutal beating, the inhuman flogging, the naked humiliation. Heaven watched and saw it all. Our rebellion, our guilt, our shame, erasing the very notion of reconciling us with God, our sin and our debt, overcoming Jesus. Here is our King, obliterated. The enemy laughing, his plans unstoppable. There's no longer the sound of freedom rising. Now God's people are utterly broken. Behold the chains of mortality. Yes, this is what is true. We had heard the stories of old. The lost are found, the blind can see, the weak are made strong. But now we are witnesses to this reality. God is dead. We'd almost believed there is a way of redemption. There is a life of fulfillment. There is a peace beyond understanding. Now we know better. For us, we can say that God is encapsulated in this one realization. The single greatest sacrifice in human history is finished. How clearly we can see it. So what's so good about Good Friday? Just one thing, that the blood of Jesus can reverse the curse of sin and raise the dead to life. How clearly we can see it is finished. The single greatest sacrifice in human history encapsulated in this one realization. We can say that God is for us. Now we know better. There is a peace beyond understanding. There is a life of fulfillment. There is a way of redemption. We had almost believed God is dead, but now we are witnesses to this reality. The weak are made strong. The blind can see. The lost are found. We had heard the stories of old. Yes, this is what is true. The chains of mortality utterly broken. Behold, freedom rising. Now God's people are unstoppable. There's no longer the sound of the enemy laughing. His plans obliterated. Here is our King, Jesus, overcoming our sin and our debt, reconciling us with God, erasing the very notion of our rebellion, our guilt, our shame. Heaven watched and saw it all, the naked humiliation, 
the inhuman flogging, the brutal beating, and this was deemed sufficient for all of us. We told ourselves that we were in control. All along, these were the plans firmly in the hands of God. Our sin drove the nails. Our sin stopped his heart. And yet, this is the incredible part of it. He never stopped loving us. The bright light of our future all in one moment, bringing death to death by way of a cross. This is the story of Jesus, the Son of God, an innocent man putting to an end the wrongdoing of all humanity. How can one describe such a day? Good Friday. <laughs>